It's good to see everyone in the chat rooms tonight. Do me a favor. Give me a wave. Uh, if you're in the chat rooms right now, I want to see who all is represented. Also, let me know where you're watching from. We'd like to know who's in the house because uh, tonight is going to be good and I want to see who is represented. But, uh, but yes, it is so good to see everybody tonight. How many have been enjoying our series lessons from the garden? You know, just to kind of do a brief recap real quick. Uh, when we kicked this off, we started talking about the, the preparation. I see everybody. Hey, India. Hey, Ashley. Hey, Chanel. Hey, Danielle. It's good to see everybody. Hey, Miss Yvette. Uh, we, we kicked this off talking about the, the preparation that God put in uh, to our placement. Because you got to understand, everything that God does has had prep time. Long before Adam and Eve got placed into the Garden of Eden, God had been at work. And we talked about how the six days of creation and how uh, some people believe it was actually 6,000 years that it took for creation because one day to God is a thousand years to us. And one, you know, and the Bible makes it clear that to God one day is a thousand years. So 6,000 years, some say, but. Uh, the gist of it is, is that way before Adam and Eve got started, God was working. And I shared how way before you ever got started, God's been working. And God does not just work on the environment, the blessing, the person that you're praying for, that you're seeking for. He's also working on you at the same time. So there is preparation. Sometimes he's getting you ready for it because it has already been prepared for you. So we talked about the, the preparation that God put into our placement. We talked about God's plans for our placement. And this was last week, we dealt with God having plans for our lives. Our lives are not our own. We are bought with a price. God has plans for our lives. He says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for your life. So when you get into God's plan that he has in mind for you and understand everything that is tied to your life has to be tied to God's plans. The jobs you take, the choices you make, the people you date, the people you marry, all that kind of stuff has to be in line with, with God's plan and God's plan for your life. Once you step into God's plans, now we can really get into the nitty gritty of tonight's message, and that is provision for my placement. Hey, Anya, I see you. Hey, Ryan. Provision for our placement. What does provision for our placement look like? Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The first thing we got to understand about God is that God, at his core, is a provider. If you're taking notes, write that down. God is a provider. Put that in the chat room, somebody for me. God is a provider. When you look at Adam and Eve, all God did was provide. He, he provided sunlight. He provided uh, the moon for nightlight. He provided the stars for direction. He pr provided uh, the animals. He provided the trees. He provided the vegetation. He provided the oxygen. He provided the water. All God does is provide. It's at his core. It's who he is. And we're going to dig into this a little bit more tonight, but Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says this, dealing with God's providing power. It says in Romans chapter 1 that, the, that what we should be able to do is look at the things from creation. And when we look at things from creation, Romans chapter 1 verse 20, it says the, the, the Godhead or, or our God is clearly seen through all of his providing so that those that say they've never heard of God, and I'm paraphrasing it, are without excuse. He's saying that you should go outside and be able to look around and see what God has created. See what God has made. 
You can't go outside and say there is no God. And he says that because of this, those that say they don't have God are without excuse. And what happens is when you don't become thankful for the things that God has already created, it, the scripture says you become unthankful and your heart is darkened. It goes on to say in verse 21. So if God never does another thing for us, he's already done enough. If you go outside, he's done enough. If you can breathe, he's he's done enough. If you've eaten, he's done enough. God is faithful. So God's proof is seen through existence, through creation. At his core, what did he do with Jesus? It says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave what was most valuable to him. And we're going to talk about Abraham in a little bit, but that's why God blessed Abraham so much is because when Abraham was willing to give up his son, he was saying, God, I deserve a blessing because I'm your friend. I deserve a blessing because I get what you're about to do. See, a person cannot really be your friend till they get you. That's why God blessed Abraham so much is because Abraham got God and God got Abraham. And when we are givers, what we are saying, God, is I may never understand what it took to give your only son, but I do understand sacrifice. And when God sees somebody that understands sacrifice, he says, we can be friends because you get me. This is why at the heart of God, God is a provider, but God blesses people that give is because when we are givers, we are like God. But understand, for God so loved the world, he gave whatever you love, you give to. Whatever you love, you give to. Why does God provide for us so much? Because he loves us. The, the Bible says in Romans 8, 31 and 32, that he says, uh, if God didn't spare his own son, why will he not with him freely give us all things? He gave the hardest thing. So if God gave the hardest thing to start with, what is a little bit of money? What is some healing? What is an opportunity, a job, what is him getting somebody in church that you've been praying for? He started at the top. He gave the best. I remember one time when I was a young man and I was dating my, my girlfriend in high school, an uh, old man said, you better stop starting out setting the bar so high because you're going to have to live up to that your whole life if y'all stay together. It didn't dawn on me till I got older what he was saying because <laughs> I was in love. But what he was saying is if you start off high, you're going to have to always stay high. What did God do with us? He started off high. So what does that mean? Until the day we die, he wants to stay high. He wants to keep showing you his love by giving over and over and over and over because he's a giver. And when you're in love, like I was, or at least I thought I was, you know, they, they say it's puppy love, but the puppy doesn't know what puppy love is. The puppy's just in love. When I was in love, I was spending my money and spending my paychecks. I didn't care because I was crazy in love. And guess what? God is crazy in love with us. And he loves when people are crazy in love with him and do the same thing. So God is a provider where your treasure is, the Bible says. That right there is where your heart will be. Whatever you give to is what you love. When people tell me they love me, I, I call their love suspect if they've never sacrificed for me. Because if you love something, you, you sacrifice for it. Put it in the chat room again. God is a provider. He is a provider. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Look at what it says. After this manner, pray. Our Father which art in heaven. 
The first thing you have to understand about God is God is a father. A good father provides for the family. This is why the Bible says if a man don't work, he's worse than an infidel. Because if a father doesn't work, he can't provide. And if he can't provide, he's setting a bad image of who God is. At God's core, he is a provider. And provision isn't always monetary. Uh, I can provide prayers for the family. Uh, you know, I can provide a warm chest and a warm heart for the family when they need somewhere to cry. But a good father is a provider. So when you pray, you got to say, our father, which art in heaven, hallow be thy name. You're, you're set apart because you're so good to me. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, what you've been saying in heaven, make it happen on earth for me. Give, 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 give. I love this. Give. This is how Jesus starts off with the Lord's Prayer. Give. Give to us our daily bread. Now, I can't ask for God to give until I look at my life and determine, does my life match the kingdom? Thy kingdom come. I can't go right for God's provision until I align my life with the kingdom. So who I'm dating, does it represent his kingdom coming? Where I'm going to hang out tonight, does it represent his kingdom coming? When people see my life, do they see that God's name in my life, God's place in my life, God's... Uh, what God has been asking for of me in my life, that whatever God wants is hollowed. It's, it's, it's set apart. That's what the tithe is. The tenth is hollowed. It means it's set apart for God. He is special. I can't go for the ask until I examine my life. That's what the Lord's Prayer is saying. It doesn't mean you've got to pray this exact prayer, but it's this system that gets God's attention. Number one, do I see God as my Father? And my father, who does not sit on earth, because if he sits on earth, he can only see what I see. But he sits in heaven, which means he can see my life from the right perspective. He sees what I need. He sees where I'm going. He knows my location. He sees stuff coming. He is on another level. And I want his will done in my life. So the first part of the Lord's Prayer is really reflection. Does my life look like the kingdom. When you look at your life right now, this evening at 6.42 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, does your life look like the kingdom? Or does your life look like the world? Because once you start building your life around the kingdom, what you are doing is you are saying, Lord, I understand last week's message. You have planned for my life. I understand as my father, you have prepared things for my life because a good father is a, prep, a man of preparation and provision. Now I can get to the good part of who you are, God. Give us this day our daily bread. I don't want to sit on it too long, but in the Old Testament, the Hebrew people had manna every day when they woke up to eat. And they were able to take as much manna as they could handle, as much manna as their appetite deemed fit. But sometimes people would get greedy and try to take tomorrow's manna just in case God didn't provide tomorrow. I got to have something left over. In other words, I got to play it safe just in case God doesn't meet us and meet the family tomorrow. And what would happen is when they did this, all the manna would rot. This is what happens when you stress about tomorrow and it hasn't even gotten here yet. If you stress about Friday on a Wednesday, then guess what? Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are going to rot in your hands. Most of the things we stress about in the future, if you can be honest and look back over your life, how many things never even happened? Give me a wave. All the different fears that hit you. And by the way, the word fear or fearful was used 365 times in the Bible. I think God was letting us know that every day you get out of bed, there will be a new fear. And the question is, will you allow your fear to become stronger than your faith? 
Or are you going to allow today to rot away because of a bill that's due at the end of the week? Because of something the doctors told you that's four months away. You name it. Fill in the blank. But are you allowing today's manna to rot because you're worried about something that hasn't even gotten here yet? Give us this day our daily bread. Give me all the blessings I need for Wednesday. And when I get up on Thursday, I'm going to pray the same thing. Give me all the blessings that are tied to my Thursday. And when I get up Friday, give me all the blessings that are tied to my Friday. And the thing you got to understand about the Lord's Prayer, it's not a before you go to bed prayer. It's a before you start your day prayer. I don't need provision before I go to bed at night. I, I, don't, I don't need blessings and open doors before I go to bed. I need to pray this before I go to work in the morning. Give us this day. You have not because you ask not. Could it be that you're not blessed because you're not praying to be blessed every day you leave the house? I pray every day, Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me. Put a new relationship into my life. Bless me. Send some money into my life. Yeah, I pray for money. Bless me. Give me some strength today, God. Bless me. Keep COVID from catching me today, God. Bless me. I want to be blessed every single day I go out of the house. Bless my kids. Bless my family. Bless my parents. Bless my city. Bless my church. And I pray this too, Lord. Bless exceeding and abundantly above all they can ask or think and believe all the tithers of uproar because they're making the vision happen. I literally call all of our tithers by name because I don't take it lightly. They're sacrificing the least I could do is say their name to God every day, even if it takes me an hour. Give us this day our daily bread. Look at somebody and say, that's sitting with you right now in your living room or on your job, ask for a blessing. He wants to do it. Look, provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, let me move on. More provision. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Provide forgiveness for me, God. And God says, I will give you provision and I will forgive you if you forgive who hurt you. I'm going to talk more about this on Sunday. But it's give and it shall be given unto you. You forgive, God says, I forgive. You hold on to it, I hold on to it. He says, and lead us not unto temptation. Provide leadership for my life, God, so that I don't mess up again. Deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's prayer is for provision. Why? Because God is a provider. Let's go a little bit further down in Matthew 6, verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewith shall we be clothed? For all these things Gentiles seek, unbelievers seek seek. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of these things. So he's saying, don't think about what you're going to eat, how you're going to fill the refrigerator. Don't think about what you're going to drink. Don't think about where you're going to be clothed. And clothing is not just clothing. Although even the Hebrew people, for 40 years, it says their sandals never withered. God has a way of stretching what he gives you. But he says, don't take no thought for how you're going to be covered, even where you're going to live. For your heavenly Father knows you have need of these things. Okay, if God knows I have need of these things, and God knows I'm work, trying to work overtime for these things, and God knows I'm cutting back on my giving because of these things, what do you want from me, God? He says, okay, I'll give you all the stuff, but here's what's required. Seek first the kingdom of God. Whoa. He says, before you seek overtime, before you start stressing, before you start calling people to borrow money, start seeking God first and his righteousness, getting your life in line. And all of these things will be added unto you. God says, the problem with most of us is we are focusing on the minor and neglecting the major. When we should be focusing on the major and not worrying about the minor. What do you mean by that? We're focused on how to fix things and play God 
rather than letting God be God and putting him first. So we put the minor things ahead of putting God first, and God says, that's backwards. Before this, he gave illustrations of birds and how they don't sow, and he takes care of them, and the lilies, how they, 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 they are clothed and covered the field, and, and no one knows how, but God takes care of it. If he takes care of the birds and he takes care of the lilies and the grass, why wouldn't he take care of you? He says, I just want you to put me first. I just want you to be crazy in love with me like you were crazy in love with her. Take, therefore, no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow, Thursday. Tomorrow, if tomorrow comes, Friday. It shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day. Uh, is, the day is the evil thereof. He's saying, stop thinking about tomorrow and seek God with everything you have today. What the devil loves to do in our lives to keep God from providing is he loves to get us to play God. That's what he loves to do. He loves to get us to play God. And what does playing God mean? Playing God means manipulating things to survive, but I never succeed. This is what happened, and I'm going to move forward quickly. In Matthew 4 with Jesus, when it says that he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Jesus had just gotten off of one of his biggest moments. John the Baptist was the top preacher at that time. People were coming into the wilderness uh, uh, beyond the Jordan to hear him preach. And he was the guy. He was baptizing people in the thousands and one day, Jesus steps into the water, and John baptizes him, and it's the only place in the Bible outside of Genesis 1 where God said, let us make man in our own image, us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the only time in the Bible that we see in one place all three members of the Trinity. We have Jesus in the water. We have the Spirit coming down like a dove, and we have the Father speaking from heaven. And what is the Father saying? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It is a moment, the Bible says, that creation was groaning for this moment. And then Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. It lets me know that after every big moment in your life, there will be a wilderness experience. Stop thinking that just because something good happened, nothing bad is following. In a lot of ways, the devil does this, and God allows it just to prove to the devil that you are the real deal, and what he's been saying about you is not him messing up about you. So after the validation of the Father comes the temptation of the enemy. So you want to be validated. Are you ready for the temptation that comes with that? And he tempted him three different times. He said, if you're the son of God, as we move forward in Matthew 4, 2, he says, if you're the son of God, Command these stones that they may be made bread. Notice the devil only, or let me put it this way. Notice the devil hit him when he was hungry. That's when the devil always will come into your life to try to get you to play God is when you're hungry. Well, I've been single for three years. You know, oh man, we've been miserable for a decade. Nobody's calling you know, why bother putting in these applications? He doesn't come to attack when everything's great. He always waits till you're hungry for something. Hungry for healing. Hungry for love. Hungry for an opportunity. And it says he came. And what did he tell him to do? Turn these stones into bread. You got to watch it when you're hungry. Because God will have you call in things bread that were never supposed to be turned. Okay, let me break it down. You've been single for a long time. 
this man looks good, this woman looks good. The devil, if you're not careful, will have you speaking to stones and calling them bread. It was never God's will for your life. But because you're hungry, you saw something that kind of looked good. And you allowed the enemy to get you to call a stone bread. Somebody else's person calling a stone bread. Somebody else's position on the job calling a stone bread. When God says those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Having done all to stand, stand. But look at what he says. He says, if you be the son of God. If. If. What do you mean if? My father already called me his son in Matthew 3. This is my beloved son. And whom I am well pleased. Look at how when you're hungry, the enemy will try to get you to question your identity. Surely Adam and Eve, he said. Surely Eve, he hasn't. Told you you can't have of every tree. Surely. He always tries to get you to question your identity. Because you're hungry. And look at what Jesus goes back to when he's hungry. Even though he's hungry, he still leans on the word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The devil takes him up to the holy city, and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Said, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down. For it's written, he will give his angels charge over you. You want to be the Messiah? Jump down like a Michael Jackson concert. And let the angels catch you and carry you before the people. And they will say that you're the Messiah. Jesus repeated himself. You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Then he shows them all the kingdoms of the world. And says I'll give them all to you in a moment of time. That's why you can't be manipulated by the enemy. He can give you whatever he wants to give you. To get you to play God. To get you to step out of order. He will give you whatever it is. You think you need. He has a way of making being out of God's will look like God's will. And Jesus said, you will worship the, you know, get behind thee, Satan. It is written, you shall worship the Lord thy God and serve only him. Uh, And it says, and then the devil leaves for a season and angels come down and start ministering to him. What do we see here? The enemy tried time after time after time to get Jesus to play provider. And Jesus said, no. I've learned the best way to do life is to wait on God. And understand with God, God will make things crystal clear. Whenever something good comes into my life, I have a check system I, I, I go through the check system. I have to make sure everything aligns with my check system. Uh, multiple things have to be in order in my check system. I need to see how my family feels. I need to talk to my spiritual father. It, it, you know, before I make any, any, any decisions, I have to go through my check system. Uh, whether, you know, whether it's adding relationships into my life, buying a house, looking at church buildings to buy, all of that kind of stuff. Because I understand how similar Satan's voice can be to God's voice in certain seasons, especially when I'm hungry. And I have a feeling tonight people have been tempting you or the enemy has been attacking you, not because you're a bad person, but because you've just been so hungry. So the devil comes. To get you to play God. So I said here tonight that God is a provider. And if you want God to stop providing, just play God. But tonight I'm going to give you keys or clues on how to get God to be who he wants to be to you. And to understand what it takes to make God show up and provide. 
Number one, we got to understand this tonight. God provides for problems. And when I say problems, I I don't mean your problems. (laughs) I'm talking about the world's problems. The, the things that he cares about, the, the people that he loves, God provides for problems. So whenever you're asking God to do something, let me give you the clues on how to get God to do it. Tie it to how it solves a problem. This will save you a lot of pain too. When it, when it comes to marriage, Lord, find the way that if God does it, for your marriage, the kingdom gets better. Thy kingdom come. I got to find the kingdom in the marriage because if you find the kingdom, not only will God bless it, but you'll start understanding the treasure that God has given you and how to not take it lightly. I want to find the kingdom in the marriage. Man, if we could get it together, Lord, our testimony, man, we survived some stuff. We survived cheating on one another. We, we survived some miscarriages. We survived some addictions. Man, if God, if you ever get a hold of us, I promise I'm going to do my part to make sure this marriage strengthens a world that is getting divorced at a rapid rate. Let my marriage be the city set on a hill, Lord. And here's what God does. He says, I hear you. Now start treating her like she's a good woman. Now start treating him like there's a ministry in him. That's where the faith comes in. Okay, God, bless my marriage for the kingdom. Bless my family. Man, I know if my family gets on fire, those kids right there, they can lead this generation to Jesus. So guess what? I'm going to start talking to them like they're going to change the world. I'm going to start reminding them of their purpose. Even if they messed up, I'm going to say there's a word in you. There's a testimony in you. God's brought you through so much. You were never supposed to even come into this world, but God made a way out of no way. I'm going to talk about our family. We're going to sit at the table and compliment each other when we sit down to eat. Why? Because there's a ministry in this family. The kingdom can have power with our family. There's healing like Hezekiah. Lord, if you heal me, I'm going to give my life to the service of the Lord. And I'm going to tell the world that God is a healer. I promise you, Lord. True story. Back when I was in Glen Burnie, I had this woman... Uh, her, her, her family was very active in the church. They asked me to pray for her. She, she had cancer. She was rapidly declining. I mean, in chemo, it got to the point where I had to go to the hospital and see her and I had to wear, uh, you know, the gurneys and I had to wear gloves and I had to wear face masks because she, she was very sensitive and, and, uh, you know, because of the treatments that she was taking. And I remember talking to her, and I would pray with her every Sunday that she was coming to church. She came every single Sunday to the altar. She said, I'm going to keep coming to the altar until God heals my body. And I asked her one day at the altar, I said, what does God get from you if he heals you? She said, Pastor, I will serve the Lord the rest of my life. I'm going to volunteer every single Sunday. That is my promise. I'm going to tie to the Lord. She told me all of this stuff. And I kept praying, and I believed God was going to do it. And guess what? God did it. Yeah, God did it. Because he is a healer. She tied it to the kingdom. But understand this. The Bible says, don't lie to me. Don't make a vow to me and make me hate your voice by reneging on it. She served for three weeks, and then I never saw her again. She was posting pictures on vacation. She was posting pictures drinking with her friends. She didn't come to church no more. And about two years later, the cancer came back with a vengeance and killed her. She broke her promise. But it's not even about the broken promise. It's going back to why God healed her. She said, Lord, if you get this out of my body, my life will be tied to the kingdom. And God gave her healing. God will give you promotion like Joseph if he looks good. If the kingdom is promoted and the atmosphere is changed on the job, God will give you 
the promotion. God will put relationships into your life. Man, I need that relationship. I need that mentor. How does the kingdom get better if you have it? And when you're single, God, if you send me a person, I don't want nobody that doesn't make the kingdom look good. So when you say that, guess what? You don't look for somebody that's living outside the kingdom. How can I say I, the kingdom will look good if you give me somebody, but all the people I'm looking for represent hell? All the people I'm dating reflect the devil's kingdom. And I'm telling the Lord, and what does this mean in this season? The Bible says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing. You can flip it, he that, she that finds a husband. But the principle is the same regardless of the sex. He that finds somebody that's getting ready for marriage. She was a wife before he found her. He was a husband before you found him. Stop dating boyfriends. Stop looking for girlfriends. Look for somebody that is already the role. They're under mentorship. They have somebody they answer to. I tell the single people in my church, there's a system. Y'all should be dating together. And, 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 and then they get a chance to talk to your pastor. Then they get a chance to talk to your family. And if you have kids, the kids shouldn't even get attached to them until marriage is being talked about and premarital counseling is taking place. Why? Because if it goes wrong, you're only going to cause abandonment issues again with the kids. And you don't know if you have a pedophile. Let's just protect the kids until we establish that this is God's will. Does the relationship you want, if God solves the problem of your singleness, that many call it a problem, but Paul calls it a gift. Because when you're single, you get to do what you want to do and don't have to answer to nobody. But if God takes care of the problem, what does he get out of you getting the person? Does it make you stronger? Or does it only cause more frustration and divide your focus? So, God loves to provide for problems. What that means is, again, is that all of the things I just mentioned, God will love to do as you establish how it solves a problem. This is where the scripture says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Give me a wave if you want me to keep going. It is more blessed to give. I'm looking for some waves. It is more blessed to give than to receive. There we go. I see you guys. Thank you, Callie. Thank you, Brittany. Hey, Anita. <laughs> hey, Fat Mata. Uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Many will tell you, if you have to choose between being on a receiving end or a giving end, I choose the giving end every day of the week. I'd rather be the one giving a blessing than the one needing a blessing. So it is more blessed to give than to receive because when God sees you getting or giving to a problem, he's going to allow your capacity to receive to be on a greater level. Once again... What you love, you give to. God so loved the world, he gave, he saw a problem, and he didn't just look at it. He gave the solution for redemption. Psalms 41, verse 1. This was our scripture all through the pandemic. Give me a wave if you remember our Psalms 41 seeds that we were sowing all through COVID. Some people still sow this seed, believe it or not. They give a $41 seed every single week and all through the pandemic, we were tying this to our food pantry and all the promises that came with the Psalms 41 seed. Look at this. It says, blessed is he that considers the poor. That means you are blessed right away when you have a heart to help people. It says, the Lord will deliver him in his time of trouble. I told you God provides for problems. When you solve a problem like taking care of the least, the lost, and the left out, God says, you don't have to claim no trouble that comes into your life. I don't know what trouble you're facing, but God says, if you're sowing into a problem, shake it off. 
like Paul shook the snake off when it bit his hand. Shake it off. Because whatever problem you have, God is not going to allow that problem to destroy you. God is not going to allow that problem to be the end of your story. God will deliver you in your time of trouble. And he won't only deliver you, he will preserve you. Oh, that's good news for some of us that didn't get blessed to the back end of our lives. God has a way of preserving us. God has a way of not letting relationships take us out. God has a way of not letting car accidents take us out. God has a way of not letting disease take us out. God has a way of not allowing viruses to get into our body. God has a way of not letting the wrong people stay too long. How many can look back at your life and see times where God preserved you. God kept you. The reason you're watching tonight is because he is still preserving you. He still has a plan for your life. He is still not done with you. Even though you've messed up and even though you failed and even though you've fallen short and even though you've been stupid at times, God says the reason you're alive today is because I have been preserving you for something so much better bigger than you. He will preserve you. He will keep you alive even if the doctors say you're going to die. This is the point of the service. Everybody will be standing and clapping. He will keep you alive when the doctors can't keep you alive. He will keep you alive when medicine can't keep you alive. He will keep you alive when chemo won't keep you alive. And he will keep you alive and even though I don't look good right now because he's keeping me alive, he's preserving me. I don't look like where I'm going. Guess what? This is the end of my story. I will be blessed upon the earth. And all my haters, how many got some haters? Sipping on some hater aid right now. God says, and I will not, I will not, I will not deliver them on him unto the will of his enemies. I need my enemies for the table he's preparing for me. You don't have to worry about who's coming at you. If you go back to verse one and just consider the poor, the Lord will strengthen him upon his bed of languishing and will make his bed in all his sickness. How many have been in bed crying yourself to sleep? Or how many have ever been in a bed crying yourself to sleep? Or so sick that you don't know how you're going to take care of yourself? God says, I got you. I got you. I'll strengthen you in your pain. And I'll make your bed in your sickness. David said, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul. For I sinned against you. In other words, I stopped focusing on taking care of your problem. And I got focused on my problems. I stopped seeking first the kingdom. And I started seeking all the stuff. And God is saying that when you flip the script and get back to solving his problems, he will get back to making sure that you are okay. He will get back to providing for all of your needs. In the Garden of Eden, before it talks about God's provision for Adam, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, it talks about how the Garden of Eden was designed to be provision for the world. This is where we're starting to get into the meat. I don't think I'm going to get into all my points tonight, but we got next week. The Garden was designed to take care of the world. And it says, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it was parted. It became in the four heads. The name of the first was Pison. And this is which compass the whole land of Halvala, where there is gold. 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 God, God's not intimidated by gold. And the gold of that land is good. 
there is Bedelum and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gion, the same as that composites the land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hedekel. And that is, it goes towards the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the river Euphrates. Look at how out of the garden water was going for the world. Out of the garden was touching gold. Out of the garden was touching precious stones. Out of the garden, out of the provision, out of the blessing, the first priority was the world. The first priority was the problem. So when we look at what will be Adam's provision, we must understand that it was not just for Adam to get fat and comfortable the purpose of the garden was also to make sure that what God created was sustained in the world. So what do we see? Well, my lesson from the garden tonight is when I pray for provision, I have to also figure out how does my provision take care of God's problem? How does my provision Take care of God's problem. How does my garden solve the world's problem? So this is our first point tonight. God provides for problems. And before I move on to God provides for purpose, and I'm going to try to move through this quickly and stop in about 14 minutes. But before I get into God provides for purpose I want you to ask yourself this question tonight as you're praying for the things I mentioned, whether it's your marriage, your family, your healing, your promotion, a relationship or relationships in general, or your singleness to change. What kingdom problem is solved? What happens if God gives that to you? How does it show the world his kingdom has just said hello through you? God provides to solve a problem. God provides for purpose. Purpose. The, the plan that God had for your life, your, your, your purpose. God provides for this purpose thing. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. My God shall supply all of your desires. No, my God shall supply all of your wants. My God shall supply all of your sexual cravings. My God shall supply your need to be validated. My God shall supply all of your bad habits. No, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In other words, God's got plenty of riches. Do you have plenty of need? And the word according is a rhythm term, one accord. They played on one accord. It's a musical term. It means rhythm. And it means that God's riches have a rhythm with need. The need comes up like Jacob's ladder. The need comes up. Riches come down. The need comes up, riches come down. The need comes up, riches come down. It's a rhythm. All of your needs, my supply, supply and need go hand in hand. How does God determine our need? He determines our need by our purpose. He determines our need by what is required as we live lives dedicated to his plan. He does not supply wants. He supplies needs. And he does not supply even the needs just because we pray. He supplies the needs, Jesus said, as we seek ye 
first the kingdom of God. All of the things, clothing, food, drink, he knows what we have need of, <laughs> but he supplies all of our needs as we fall in rhythm with his plan. God provides for purpose. And how does he look and determine our needs in each season? He looks at, are we being faithful with what we have now when we think it's not enough? Like the widow woman with the meal. Will we give it to God even if it means me and my child could die? The woman with the oil. Will, will I gather the vessels and give God room to stretch my little bit of oil? Like the little boy's lunch. Will I give it over to God and risk me not eating today? He supplies all of your need. He's looking at what are you doing right now with what he has given you? What are you doing right now with what he has given you? Because he doesn't give need based off of prayer, and he doesn't give need based off of excuses. He looks at our actions. He looks at our faith, and that's how he determines. I got to put something in your life. Let's go a little bit further with it, further with this. Genesis chapter 2, we're talking about Adam. Adam has been walking in his purpose. He has been tilling the ground, walking in his purpose. God sees Adam carrying so much weight for the kingdom. <sighs> Poor Adam. It's not good. That man should be alone. We weren't created to be alone. It's not good that man should be isolated. You know, it's been said that when people don't have friends, they create habits. Being alone is dangerous. And God says it's not good that man is alone. He's been doing too much. And my God shall supply all of your need. He's been doing too much. And when you read the story of Adam, he's doing everything and he's never complaining. Even though it's clear that creation is doing things that he probably wishes he could do. You know, you got to keep it real. Imagine looking at those zebras and saying, man... That, that looks kind of cool, but <laughs> I don't have another me or something made in the image of God like me to do that with. So uh, that stinks. He never complains that everything else has it better than him. He doesn't complain when he sees the animals sitting around doing nothing. He's just working because it is personal. It is between him and his creator. He is the mirror of God, and he has one goal at the end of the day. He wants to be able to go to bed and say, God, when you looked at me, did you look in a mirror today? Because Adam was made in the image of God. This is what happened when God said, Adam, where art thou? It wasn't that God didn't know his location. It was that when God saw Adam... In his fallen state, he didn't see himself no more. He was so used to waking up in the morning, or not waking up, but Adam waking up in the morning and God visiting him, and God would look at Adam, but God would see a mirror of himself. When Adam sinned, the mirror was shattered until Jesus came. And here he is putting fig leaves on. Remember, Jesus talked about what happens when the branch is disconnected from the vine. In a lot of ways, the fig leaves that Adam was putting on, he was disconnecting the leaves from the tree, and immediately they would have started to die. And the fig leaves that Adam covered himself in were a reflection of how Adam had disconnected himself from the vine. The dying man was covered in dying clothing. 
and God couldn't, re- God couldn't recognize Adam any longer. But until the fall, Adam was so excited to look like Jesus, to look like the Father, to look like the Holy Spirit. He, he just wanted to be like them so much. And God said, you know what, Adam, you're in your purpose. I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to provide. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air. He brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Side note, when you're in the will of God, God never has to question what you call things. That just went over somebody's head. God doesn't have to question what you call that job. God doesn't have to question what you call your sickness. God doesn't have to question what you call that woman, what you call that man. You say husband, I'm not questioning. You say wife, I'm not questioning. You look at the job, you say opportunity, I'm not questioning. You look at the sickness, you say healing, I'm not questioning. Because when you're in the will of God, if God's in you and his words don't drop, why would he let your words fall? And it says that God was curious to see, what's Adam going to name it? And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But here it is. But for Adam, there was no help meet for him. Help, help, help. Help for what? The kingdom. <laughs> it, it doesn't say that. Be, for, and for Adam, there was no one to cuddle with him. There was no one to go on date nights with him. There was no one to have sex with him. No, no, no. For Adam, there was no help. Adam was walking in his purpose, and God said, the kingdom needs Adam to have a wife. To every single person, stop manipulating the system and let the kingdom establish you need something. And you know the kingdom will establish it when it is kingdom people blessing it. For Adam, there was no help need for him. So what did God do to bless the faithful man? He caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and Adam slept. He caused a dark season in the midst of Adam's service to come upon him. You mean to tell me, that when things start going wrong in my life and I see it as darkness, it could be that God is up to something. You mean to tell me that when serving the kingdom goes dark, the worst thing for me to do is quit? You mean to tell me when serving in the kingdom goes black, The worst thing for me to do is to talk bad about God? Yes. (laughs) The fact that it went black, the fact that it went dark, is an indicator that God is pulling something out of you. In the midst of Adam's serving, Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side. The disciples are freaking out. What is Jesus doing on the boat? He's sleeping. Why? Because sleep is required before you get to the next blessing. And the rib which the Lord took from man made he woe man, woman, man with a womb, and brought her to Adam. Brought her to Adam. Brought her to Adam. Notice this. Brought her to Adam. Adam didn't have to go take her. He brought her to Adam. And guess what? Every woman doesn't have to go out and find Adam. God says, if you just serve, you will be brought to Adam. Look at how God is showing us a glimpse of his e-harmony. <laughs> his 
way of putting things together is through service in the kingdom. His way of putting things together was through provision with purpose. God is saying, I want to provide for you like Adam. I want to bring things into your life. I made them. I'm bringing the blessings to you. You get to name them. I'm going to give you some help. And Adam got to name her too. God didn't name her woman. Adam named her woman. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But notice what service did for Adam. Service for Adam allowed God to pull something out of him. All right, we're bringing this thing home. But Paul says this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Work out, work out. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Work out what has already been placed in is what Paul's saying. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't work out anybody else's. Work out your purpose. And make it your top priority. Why? For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What it's saying here is that as you work out, as you serve out, as you give to God outwardly, as you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, God says, I am going to pull out of you what's already been placed inside of you. When I was a kid, my mom used to make popcorn all the night for TGIF. Give me a wave if you remember TGIF. Some good old hanging with Mr. Cooper. Family Matters, Step by Step, Boy Meets World. <laughs> I'm taking y'all on a mem trip down memory lane right now. And remember the popcorn that you would put in and you would hear it popping on, on the oven, actually? That's how we would make it. You hear it popping? Now, when you would hear it popping, it was because inside was a bunch of hard kernels. And, and every now and then, one wouldn't get cooked well enough, and it may get in your mouth, and you chew on it and spit it out. But they all started that way. They were all kind of hard. What did the heat do? The heat brought what was on the inside to the outside. Now it could be eaten. But in its original state, it could crack a tooth. But when the heat worked out what was on the inside of it, it got bigger, it got fluffy, it tasted good. That's what happens to us in our serving. The heat comes from God, the darkness comes from God to work out of us what God has always had deep down inside of us. Everything you need is in you. And God says, as you walk in your purpose, light seasons or going to sleep seasons, Adam. Bright seasons or dark seasons, Adam. If you're walking in your purpose, don't question whether or not I'm providing for you. I'll give you one more because I was just reminded that we actually have prayer service next Wednesday night. Yeah, I'm excited. Prayer service next Wednesday night in the building. We'll also be streaming online. So I'm going to go a little bit further. Give me 10 more minutes tonight, and I'm going to hit my last point. So when we come back, we're moving forward. So we said here that God provides for problems. God provides for purpose. And lastly, this is it, and I'm going to move through this quickly. God provides for principles. Yes, principles. The Bible calls it seed time, harvest time. Genesis 8.22 says it. Seed time, harvest time. You sow, you get back. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 10 says this. 
He that sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Whenever you watch, we're talking about seed time, harvest time. Whenever you see a farmer sowing, they don't throw one seed out here and one seed out there. They are throwing handfuls out. And they are trusting that out of those handfuls, a majority is going to hit the ground, sit right, and come up for a reaping season. The scripture says some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And I used to wrestle with what did that mean? 30%, 60%, 100%? No. What it meant was that when you sow and you get 100%, that means 100% of the seeds that hit the ground are coming back as a blessing. That's ridiculous. That, any farmer would tell you, is impossible. 30 is impossible, actually. 60 is impossible. Every farmer is lucky if they can get 5 to 10% of the seeds to stick. But God says when you sow in handfuls, don't be surprised if every single seed you release comes back to you. If you sow little, you get little. If you sow big, you get big. Every man as he purposed in his heart, let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. And it goes on to say, now he that ministers seed to the sower. Seed to the sower. That means not only does God love cheerful givers, but he's going to make sure that every person throwing seed has something to throw every week. Every week. Moving forward, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, excuse me, says, on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in stores, God's prospered him, that there may be no gatherings when I come. Paul says, on the first day of the week, that's why we come to church on Sundays, on the first day of the week, it's the first day of the week, if I start it off with God, it's going to finish with God. But he says, not only come to church on the first day of the week, but we are supposed to pay our tithes on the first day of the week. Because it's a principle. Money is a principle. It's not a miracle. It's a principle. He says, if you give your tithes on the first day of the week, I'm going to make sure that you finish the week with something to give on the next Sunday. It's a principle on the first day of the week. So if I don't give, and many give when they get paid, and God gets all that, but I'm saying there's a principle of this is what God expects from me, and if I don't do it, I cannot ask him each day to give me my daily bread. Because it's a principle. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it shall be given unto you. It, whatever you give to the kingdom is what comes back to you. So if I give my time, I'll get time back. If, if, if I give of my finances, finances are coming back to me. It all comes down to your purpose and what do you need to do your purpose. And if you're not giving it, you can't pray for it. It is give and it shall be given. I said in the beginning, everything we're praying for, marriage, family, healing, promotion, relationship, singleness. What are we doing now to show God what we will do with more later? Because if I don't give it, I can't pray for it. I'm moving forward quickly, but Malachi chapter 3, it says, Will a man rob God, yet you've robbed me? You say, God, I'd never do that to you. You're my Jesus. Where have I robbed thee? <laughs> In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord. If I will not open up the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. What is Malachi saying? He says, number one, when you give, you're loading the storehouse for us to solve God's problems. That's how we feed the poor. That's how we do outreach. That's how we keep the building going. But you're, you're, you're taking care of God's problems with your finances. Number two, you are making God your business partner. 
So if God is the one blessing you, he says, isn't it right that I get something back? That's why he feels robbed. He is your business partner. Without him, you can do nothing. So why forget about him when you get something? Number three, he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. That means that devil that you're fighting, look how powerful tithing is. He says, I will stop the devil from destroying your life if you show me you trust me with your finances. Because it's a principle. And lastly, he says, I will stop your blessings from rotting before they get a chance to hit their full potential. They will not, they will not be destroyed before their time in the field. And all nations will call you blessed. You don't have to tell people you're blessed and highly favored. They're going to tell you that when you walk in the room. For you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. God provides for principles. And this is it, and I'm done. And I'm not even going to read it. You got homework to do. But in Genesis chapter 4, we see, this, we see the story of Cain and Abel. Most believe they were twins, uh, you know, that they were born because Abel was born right after Cain, and he would have been the first one, like, like, uh, like Esau and Jacob. And it says that Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Abel was working in what his dad was covered with. Remember, God covered Adam with the skin of the animal, the skin of a sheep, and the blood dripped down him, cleansing him from all of the sin he just committed. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain was working in his father's curse. Remember, God cursed the ground. So one is working in the solution, and the other is working in the problem. And in a process of time, because time always reveals where a person is. Cain brought a sacrifice from the ground. Why does God want what he cursed? It'd be like telling somebody you hate something, like, I hate canned green beans. And then for Christmas, they get me packaged and wrapped nicely a whole bunch of canned green beans. Why are you bringing me what I hate? <laughs> you never looked at it that way, did you? God cursed the ground. You're bringing me what I cursed. Why are you bringing me what I hate? But if we're not careful and we don't understand God, what happens is we do this day in and day out. We don't give God what he wants. We give God what he hates. And Abel is bringing God the first fruit, the firstlings of his flock, he is bringing God the tithe. And it says, they brought them, which most believe, to the Garden of Eden's door because the family was evicted because of dad. And they brought it to the Garden of Eden at the door. And the reason Cain knew Abel's sacrifice was accepted and the way that God showed Abel's sacrifice was accepted is fire came down from heaven and consumed Abel's sacrifice. And God looked at Cain and said, Cain, why is your countenance falling? He says, if you do what Abel did, you can get what Abel got. You want my fire? You want the provision of my fire? You want the provision of my acceptance? You want the provision of my favor? Then do what somebody that's doing it right is doing. And this comes down to this. Am I so stuck on not changing me that I would rather hate on people being blessed than admit that maybe me is not the right type of person to step into a blessing? And humility has to step in and say, maybe I am doing this thing wrong. I meet people all the time and say, I just don't want to change. I don't want nobody to change me. But how has being you worked for you? God has a way of putting Abel's in our lives to show us the possibilities 
of practicing principles. To every person in the chat room right now that faithfully ties every single week, don't leave me hanging, give me a wave. Those hand waves are your ables. They are people showing you that it works, people showing you that God can open up doors, people showing you that he can kick out the devil, people showing you that he has a way of keeping your blessing, people showing you that he wants to be your partner, people showing you that he wants people to call you blessed. Those are your testimonies. Those are the proof that if you do this stuff, it will work for you. Cain, your countenance is falling because me and you are not good. And this lets me know that I cannot be happy and not be a giver. I cannot experience the provision of God and not be like God and be a provider for the kingdom. This lets me know that my happiness and my sacrifice are tied to one another. And if I really want to be happy, I need to start getting my principles in order so that I can experience God's providing power when principles are applied. And these are just the ways that God wants to provide for us as we're in our placement. So what does he want to do? He, he wants to show us that he provides for problems. So tonight you have to figure out what problem are you in the church to solve? What problem are you in the world to solve? What problem? You're praying for a marriage. What problem does it solve if you get it? You're praying for your family to change. What problem does it solve when you get it? You're praying for your kids to get together, but you don't even bring them to youth nights at the church. What problem does God getting your family in line fix? You want to be healed. What does God get when he heals you? You want to experience promotion. Okay, you put in 140 characters or less, how God will look better on your job. You want relationships. How do they make the kingdom better? And you don't want to be single no more. You want to be married. What does the kingdom get if you get a woman or if you get a man? If you can answer that, I will be shocked if God doesn't move soon in your life, in the area that you just presented, not to me, not in the chat room, but to God. So we talked about God provides for problems. God provides for purpose. This is why you got to walk in your purpose. David was walking in his purpose, and what did God provide? A giant opportunity named Goliath that would change his future. He was faithful with few things. God said, here's your giant opportunity to be a ruler over many things. And God provides for principles. You need to make up in your mind tonight that before this year is over, I am going to start tithing. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I don't need your money because I don't get paid from this church. <laughs> But God is trying to use your money and bring you into a partnership with him so that he can show you what trying him looks like and what him rebuking the devil looks like and what him allowing you to be the head and not the tail looks like and what you being seen as blessed when you walk in the room feels like. You got to get this in order. There's people watching tonight, been in church five, ten years, still have never tithed. And you keep praying for money. I see you, Kylie. Thanks for having my back. <laughs> Kylie said, tithing works with like five, 100. It works. So if we want the fire to hit our sacrifice like Abel, we got to get this in order. We're in the fourth quarter. I have great expectation for 2025. I'm doing my part personally and ministry-wise, 
What are you doing right now? And maybe for somebody, tonight's tonight, you say, you know what? Starting tonight, the message hit my heart, and I'm going to have to cancel getting my hair done this weekend. I'm going to look raggedy for a season so I can look set up for decades. For somebody, you're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to give up something you love for a season so that God can set you up for the long run and be happy. God provides for principles. And I didn't say this, but the Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Not the devil. Money and the love of it is the root. The devil is not the root of all evil. We blame it on the devil. But if you want to get down to the root, the root of the problem, like a weed, you get the root, the weed don't grow back. You want to get down to the root of the problem, you like you want to get down to the root of your problem, the, the, the root of the money. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. You want to get to the root of all evil in your home, get the money in order. You want to figure out where is all the evil in the world coming from, whether it's wars or politics, all evil can be traced back to how it affects money. So let's show God that we don't love stuff more than we love him. Did you get something tonight, everybody? I see you, Shannon. It does work. It does work. Well, I hope you got something tonight. Uh, we are continuing our series in two weeks. I hope to see everybody at prayer service next week. Uh, we are going to begin getting back to prayer service once a month in the sanctuary. So please, please, please join us. There's power in coming together and praying. This is what shook foundations all through the book of Acts. This is what made God do mighty things in the book of Acts. This is what got people out of prisons and made chains fall in the book of Acts and all throughout history. And that, that is when people come together to pray, where two or three gather together, God said, I am in the midst. So join us next Wednesday. We will be here, I believe, and I could be saying it wrong. You know what? I'm not saying a time. Just go ahead and put it in the chat room. You know, in the, in, you know our, there we go. They got it in there. 6 p.m. And we'll see you next week. It is giving time online. Yes. It is our chance to load the storehouse up. To show God that this stream is worth something to you. It takes a lot of resources just to do these streams. But, uh, but we do it because we care about your growth. We are invested into your growth. And this is our chance to show reciprocity and sh so back into the kingdom. We are gearing up for our turkey giveaways. Man, we got so many turkeys to buy. Deadlines are approaching. And so everybody that can sow tonight, please, please, please get behind our vision. Even if it's a dollar, it is not about the size of the gift. God will stretch the gift. God just needs you to give him something that he can stretch. So we got multiple ways to give. Give however you feel comfortable. We will leave that up for a moment. I'm going to lift up every seed that is represented. Wherever you're giving from the night, just lift it up. If you're in your home, in your car, or your job, I want God's presence to meet you in that place. Dear Lord, I lift up every seed represented tonight, God. I lift up every person that is sowing into the vision of this ministry that you would bless them exceeding and abundantly, Lord, above all that they may ask or think, Lord. Do something so big, God, in their lives. I pray that this seed is attached to that prayer they're lifting up for the kingdom, that, that marriage they're lifting up, God, that as you get the marriage in order, the kingdom is going to change. That family, God, that the family is going to get on one accord and lead people to Jesus. That healing, God, I stand in agreement with it, that when you bring that healing to the body, Lord, the devil is going to be scared of how they serve you. I pray for that promotion, God, that that increase would come, God, before the year is out. Let that promotion take place, Lord. I pray for relationships that are coming, God, that have the keys to the next level. I pray, Lord, that as the kingdom is made better, that that relationship would come. I pray for that single person that is frustrated, Lord, that you would send that Boaz, Lord, or that Ruth into their life, God, that would show them, Lord, not only that you didn't forget about them, but Lord, I pray that as they get that relationship, that the kingdom would be made better, God. Have your way, Lord. 
We pray, Lord, that you would keep us till we come together this weekend. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, well, I love you, everybody. I will see you this Sunday for the closeout of our recent series. You don't want to miss it. I'm going to be talking about a topic that I think will hit us all at our core. And ultimately, I'm believing this Sunday is going to be a healing service. Uh, I'm not going to let the cat out the bag, but I think it's going to hit some deep stuff that, that we've been carrying around. And I have a feeling that when people leave the building, they are going to feel refreshed and relieved. So join us this Sunday. Bring somebody with you that's in a bad place, somebody that's been battling some things throughout their whole life. I really am expecting God to move powerfully this Sunday. I want to see you in the building. Until we come together this weekend, I love you and we're out.